Good morning, everyone. This is Dave Mazzo, and I'm the President and Chief Executive Officer of Caladrius Biosciences, where we're developing regenerative therapies that reverse chronic disease. I'm very pleased to be here this morning, and thank you for the time and attention you're giving to me so that I can provide an update on the progress our company is making in developing our CD34 cell therapies. As with all the other public companies, I'll just remind you that I will be making some forward-looking statements throughout the course of my presentation, and I'll ask that you keep this in mind as you make investment decisions. Let's start with a summary of the company. We are a platform company using CD34 cell therapy to build a multi-product development pipeline. Among the products in development, we have two clinical programs that have the regenerative medicine breakthrough classification in the jurisdictions where they're being developed. And I'll speak more about those and all of our programs momentarily. We have proprietary field leading technology. We're working only in those areas of very high unmet medical need, which do provide then lucrative global indication opportunities. And we're backed by a strong intellectual property portfolio. Importantly for investors, we have multiple potential value creating events over the course of the next year to two across uh, a variety of programs in the pipeline based on data execution and corporate development milestones. Our balance sheet is quite strong. We, our last report was the end of the third quarter of uh, 2020, at which time we reported about $40 million in cash, no debt, and cash runway projected to fund operations through the entirety of 2020. 21. And we're operated by a seasoned management team, which has noteworthy domain and therapeutic expertise. So let's take a few moments and talk about the basics of our platform before we get into the program specifics. So CD34 cells, unlike many cell therapies, actually have a very well-characterized mechanism of action. The uh, MOA has been documented preclinically and clinically and reported in a variety of peer-reviewed journals over the last uh, decade or more. CD34 cells are naturally occurring endothelial progenitor cells that reestablish blood flow to underperfused tissues. They are pre-programmed by nature to be pro-angiogenic and anti-inflammatory. So think of them as providing a biological bypass at the microvasculature level. They essentially provoke the growth of new capillaries, which then reperfuses tissues that are under-oxygenated and undernourished. The cells have been studied extensively uh, in the clinic across a variety of ischemic disease indications by numerous investigators in many sites in many countries. So the point being that this is not a technology that is the art of a single person working in a single place, but something that is well characterized well-controlled, validated, and even have gone through technology transfers across uh, multiple continents. Our cells have repeatedly demonstrated the ability to provide vascular repair in multiple tissues, and the results from the clinical studies, which encompass more than a 1,000 patients now that have been published in peer-reviewed journals, are consistent and compelling in that they show a single treatment elicits a durable therapeutic effect and that we've never had a cell-related adverse event reported, which is important um, given that this is an autologous cell therapy, so the patient receives his or her own cells, and you would expect that there'd be very little immunogenicity as a result. Our process for providing the therapy is actually simple, uh, well-defined, GMP, economical, and scaled. So unlike many other autologous therapies, which take long times, weeks, sometimes months, and can cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, ours are, are, are very straightforward. We are four days from vein to vein, as we say in the business. Uh, the process starts with a GCSF-induced mobilization of the patient's CD34 cells, which induces the cells to migrate from their natural habitat in the bone marrow into the peripheral blood, uh, where they can be collected through an apheresis process. Um, at the time of the apheresis, then a sample of those monocytes are sent to a central processing facility, where they are then the CD34 CX CR4 cells are isolated, concentrated, and then formulated in a proprietary media that is then specific to 
the indication and the site of administration and the site of administration or the mechanism of administration is, of course, uh, indication dependent. And they get sent back to the same patient where they are administered. Uh, there is no need for surgical bone marrow aspiration, so it's a much less uh, intrusive process. We do no genetic manipulation or ex vivo expansion of the cells, so there's much less uh, that can go wrong during the handling of the cells. And as I mentioned, the cost of goods is, uh, is, is quite reasonable, and the time from donation to treatment is also relatively short. Our intellectual property portfolio is actually quite uh, extensive. We have a number of patents granted in the United States and around the world with several others uh, pending. And they cover those aspects of the product that would be akin to the things covered by a composition of matter patent for a small molecule. So this includes the pharmaceutical composition of the non-expanded CD34 CXCR4 cells, the therapeutic concentration range in which they work, the stabilizing serums that we use as part of the formulation, and of course, the repair of injury caused by vascular insufficiency as the target uh, indication. And so with that as background, let me introduce you to our pipeline. It has currently four active programs, as you can see here, CLBS-16 in coronary microvascular dysfunction, Honedra or CLBS-12 in critical limb ischemia and Berger's disease, CLBS-201 in chronic kidney disease, and Oligo or CLBS-14 in no option refractory disabling angina. Each of these programs is at a, you know, at, at, at a, at a, key point in its development from a clinical perspective with a number of milestones coming up in the near future. I will speak to those specifically in just a moment, but it is important to note two things from, from this slide and for the rest of the presentation. The first is that even though all of these products are based on the same CD34 cells that are prepared in a very similar fashion, these products are defined by the regulatory authority as being distinct and not interchangeable. So in fact, we cannot substitute one for another in an indication. They are very specific. The other thing I'll mention, as I imagine most CEOs are mentioning these days, is that we've done our best here to anticipate the impact of COVID-19 on our programs going forward and to build that into our projections. But none of us really know what the long-term impact of COVID-19 will be on the ability to execute clinical trials in a timely fashion. So all of our timelines are subject to influence by the pandemic, and that's a bit out of our control. So let's start with what we believe is our near-term biggest value driver, CLBS-16 in coronary microvascular dysfunction, which is a program being developed currently in the United States. And before I talk about this and some of our other cardiovascular programs, I think it's worthwhile that I mention or remind you all that cardiovascular disease remains the number one killer in the United States. More than oncology, more than accidental deaths or respiratory disease or stroke. And so it's important that we don't lose sight of this and that we continue to develop new therapies to treat this, uh, this growing disease. The other thing that I think is worthy of mention comes out of the AHA scientific sessions in 2019 where the results of the ischemia trial were presented. And they showed that the current standard of care of interventional heart procedures, as well as pharmacotherapy, or excuse me, interventional heart procedures, did not reduce the overall rate of major adverse cardiac events or death compared with just the available pharmacotherapy so, or lifestyle changes. So this clearly shows that treatments beyond what we have today are necessary to address this growing problem in heart disease. So let's talk specifically about coronary microvascular dysfunction. CMD is in fact a deficiency in the heart microvasculature with no accompanying large vessel obstructive disease. So to put this in, in the context of example, if you have a patient, and often these patients are female in the ratio of about two to three to one to male, and an orphan, they're often premenopausal women as well. These women will be having chest pain 
that gets bad enough that they go to see a cardiologist. The cardiologist maybe does a stress test, and, and they fail the stress test, and they send them off to the cath lab for an angiogram with the expectation that they're going to find one or more lesions or blockages in the larger vessels that can be then stented or bypassed if they're really serious. They get the patient in, they go through the angiogram, and there are no large vessel obstructions, yet the patient has truly debilitating frequent angina episodes. And they then perform a test called a coronary flow reserve a test. It's done a variety of ways, but, but most commonly with a laser Doppler technique. And they determine that, in fact, they have a deficiency of flow in the cardiac muscle based upon an insufficient capillary system. And that's what needs to be to be treated. And it's interesting in that these patients have the same very poor prognosis for sig significantly elevated risk of all-cause mortality and, and MACE, as do patients who have large vessel disease. So it's, it's a serious problem that goes just beyond pain. And uh, it's one that now can be quantitatively diagnosed using CFR. It's a large population here in the United States. If you go through the, the various bullet points on the slide and get down to the bottom, you see that the math shows that there are somewhere between a half a million and a million and a half um, potentially treatable patients with CMD in the United States alone. And, and that's a really big population of people who have an unmet medical need. There are currently no approved products for coronary microvascular dysfunction. Recently, we completed a proof of concept trial called the ESCAPE CMD trial, the preliminary results for which were reported at the AHA meeting in November of 2019, and then the final results at the Sky Scientific Sessions in May of 2020. This was a 20-subject open-label trial looking at a single intracoronary fusion of CLBS-16 and looking at the therapeutic effect and safety of the product measured over the course of six months with coronary flow reserve as well as a number of symptomatic scores as endpoints. And the results of this trial were truly unique and compelling. Um, for the first time, a therapy demonstrated the ability to take a patient that was diagnosed as having CMD, according to CFR, a quantitative measurement, and bringing them back into the normal range. That means that the treatment actually adjusted the pathophysiology of the heart and reduced the symptom scores in a highly statistically significant fashion, even though this was a relatively small trial. And this was all done by a single administration and, of course, you know, durable at least through six months, which was the, the end point here for this particular trial. All the accompanying symptom scores also were shown to be statistically significantly improved. So again, we have an ability to adjust disease progression, reverse the course of the disease, regenerate the heart, and uh, show that through symptom stores as well. And that's important because some of these symptom scores, like angina frequency and exercise tolerance, et cetera, are the typically accepted regulatory endpoints in angina studies uh, for registration trials. So the summary of this was that we, show, we showed you know, a significant improvement in heart function and symptoms. We saw no evidence of cell-related adverse events. Uh, this is now the first therapy that potentially reverses CMD after a single administration, and we expect that that will lead to a de decreased risk of long-term MACE and CV-related death in these patients. Uh, and it's led us to the initiation of a phase 2B trial as the next logical step in development. The FREEDOM trial initiated uh, in the fourth quarter of last year with sites opening, so in December. And actually, just this morning, we announced the first treatment, the first patient treated in this trial. Uh, and we have top-line data anticipated in the early third quarter of 2022. This is a double-blind, placebo-controlled, randomized trial with a single intracoronary infusion and looking at the endpoints that are both um, physiologic in terms of peak flow reserve and also symptom related and also those that are most regulatorily accepted in angina frequency, exercise time, and some health related quality of life measures as well. So now let's move on to Ponedra, which is actually of all the programs, the one that's closest to registration. 
It's being developed for critical limb ischemia and a type of critical limb ischemia called Berger's disease, which is an orphan indication. In Japan, it has a Sakagaki designation, which is a, a special regulatory status, which gives us the benefits of uh, the equivalent of breakthrough and fast track in terms of increased interactions with the agency, um, some the opportunity for an early conditional approval, and a guaranteed six-month review time on our filing. Uh, critical limb ischemia, as most of you know, is a severe arterial obstruction that impedes blood flow in the lower extremities. It's usually the lower legs and most often the foot. It's often found as a comorbidity in diabetes and uh, patients with hypertension, and it includes severe rest pain uh, as well as non-healing ulcers. Uh, the rest pain often needs to be treated with narcotics. It gets so bad and these patients become uh, non-ambulatory. And the non-healing ulcers can actually uh, remain um, festering sometimes for, for months and months on end. Um, Berger's disease, as I mentioned, is a subset of CLI. It's an orphan indication uh, that also uh, responds to uh, similar treatments, except that in the case of Berger's disease, almost every patient inevitably goes on to amputation and, and often succumbs eventually to the disease. Um, these patients all have persistent symptoms even after they've exhausted all the available CLI treatments, including um, interventional procedures and pharmacotherapies. And uh, this is a roughly $200 million peak annual sales estimated opportunity in Japan alone. Just to give you an idea again of the seriousness of CLI, it, is, it has rather a much higher mortality and, um, and also uh, a, a higher incidence rate than most cancers. Uh, so even though it's not talked about so often, it is an insidious uh, disease. And we're treating those patients who are considered moderate to severe on the Rutherford scale, having Rutherford 4 and 5 level disease. The basis for our enthusiasm for this program comes from some early phase two work done both in Japan on the left and the United States on the right using the uh, CLI free achievement as the endpoint in Japan as well as uh, amputation free survival in the United States. And you can see in both of these cases a single dose of our CD34 cells um, quickly uh, reduced most patients from having CLI to being in a CLI free status which then persisted for at least four years in the trial on the left and showed a remarkable and highly statistically significant improvement in amputation-free survival on the right. And that led us to what is now ongoing in Japan, a registration-eligible trial under the Sakagaki designation, where the endpoint is continuous CLI-free status, which means two consecutive monthly visits without any breast pain and all ulcers healed and no new ulcers form them, and that's all adjudicated by an independent panel of physicians. It's a 37 trial, 37 subject trial, with seven of those patients having Berger's disease, and uh, we are basing this on a single intramuscular injection um, or treatment uh, that is then followed over time. This is the trial in our pipeline that has been the most impacted by COVID-19 because in Japan, most clinical trial enrollment was shut down last year between February and October. We began re-enrolling patients in November, and then uh, Japan declared a state of emergency on January 6th, and we're shut down again at least until the middle of February. So we'll see where we go. As a result, we've adjusted our projections for completion of enrollment. We are truly only a handful of patients away from completing, but we now project a second quarter, um, 21, completion of enrollment, which would lead us to top-line data in the second quarter of 22, uh, a JNDA sometime in the second half of 22, and uh, the earliest possible approval on six-month review time in very early 2023. And we do expect, of course, that we will commercialize this in Japan with one of several interested uh, Japanese pharmaceutical companies. Uh, and then I'll just mention, you know, again, that we do have, this is an open label trial in, in agreement with the regulatory authorities in Japan. And so I'll talk about the completed cohort for Berger's disease 
And, and here the results are, are truly um, outstanding. Uh, we have uh, approximately 60% of the patients who have achieved, uh, who, are of our, who have received our treatment have achieved the CLI-free status, which is amazing given that the natural patient evolution is continual deterioration to amputation for all patients. So this is quite, quite encouraging, and, and we hope that this will contribute very heavily to what we expect to be a positive trial at the end of the enrollment period. Spend a moment talking about our newest program, CLBS 201, which is going to target chronic kidney disease. And you know, I think many of you realize that kidney disease is an increasingly uh, prevalent problem. It is um, a, a problem of an aging population, which we have in the developed world, and is also uh, exacerbated by uh, the comorbidities of diabetes and hypertension. And so as those things increase as well, you see more and more kidney disease. So it's a very large unmet medical need. Uh, we're going to be looking at patients with stage 3B and stage 4 kidney disease. These are moderate to severe patients for whom GFR or glomerular filtration rate is decreasing at a, uh, at a very measurable rate and who are clearly on their way to, to total kidney failure and the need for dialysis and or kidney transplantation. Um, the rationale here is quite simple. The pathophysiology of, of, of the disease denotes that there's a compromised renal microvasculature, and so the kidneys can no longer filter effectively. And since we have both preclinical and clinical studies that show that we can, in the kidney and in other organs, uh, regenerate microvasculature, it makes sense to test our CD34 cells as a regenerative therapy in this disease. And we're looking not only to stabilize kidney function, uh, that is, prevent the further deterioration, but actually regenerate the kidney and, and, and hopefully for the first time have a therapy that can actually improve the GFR in these patients. And that's a study that we'll be moving forward to in the near term. The study will probably be a, 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 a controlled trial. We say here open label, but more likely it will be placebo controlled, about 40 or 50 patients. And we're looking to, to file an IND in the early second quarter and initiate this trial in the late uh, second quarter of this year, top-line data targeted for uh, middle of 2022. And then finally, I'll spend a few moments talking about OLIGO, or CLBS-14, which is our program in no-option refractory disabling angina. This program has been awarded an RMAT designation by the US FDA, and an RMAT is akin to a Sakagaki in Japan. Uh, it gives you the benefits of breakthrough and, and fast-track designations in your interactions with the regulatory authorities. NORDA is actually similar in some ways uh, physiologically to, uh, to CMD. The distinction between a NORDA patient and a CMD patient is that NORDA patients have large vessel obstructions that were thought initially to be the singular cause of their debilitating angina. Those lesions have been effectively treated by angioplasty, stenting, bypass surgery, and available pharmacotherapies, yet the disabling angina persists. And upon further examination, it's shown that the cardiac microcirculation remains the problem in this case. So CMD is a pure microvasculature disease. NORDA is a combination disease where the large vessel problems have been treated, and what remains now is the treatment of the small vessels. From an epidemiologic perspective, NORDA, in fact, is defined as a orphan population, and we are now in discussions with FDA to see if they will be in a position to grant this subset of the larger refractory angina population an orphan designation for oligo. Uh, oligo has been studied extensively, as indicated here on the slide, in um, blinded, randomized, placebo-controlled trials, uh, large phase two, that was 168 patients, and even some early phase three work, uh, all of which showed statistically significant improvements in the exercise capacity, reduction in angina, and reduction in mortality of these patients, as long, uh, along with a pristine 
safety profile. And we've had a discussion with FDA, which has resulted in a proposal from them for an acceptable phase three protocol, which we think is still probably uh, a bit too large and too lengthy. And we're continuing to have dialogue with the FDA to determine if we can reduce the size and scope of this trial. But it is uh, currently a trial that is 400 patients in size, placebo controlled with a standard of care arm. I think what's most important for people to recognize here is that the FDA has agreed that the primary endpoint would be change in exercise time from baseline at six months, which is in fact the endpoint that we study in the phase 2B, which we demonstrated a highly statistically significant ability to hit in the same patient population with the same uh, process and the same dosing. So that's one very important point. The other very important point is that if people try to compare our programs with the recently reported outcome of mesoblasts chronic heart failure uh, program, where they failed to meet their primary endpoint, which was an outcomes endpoint, you'll notice that FDA has not required an outcomes trial for us. So this is actually a much higher probability of success once we do initiate uh, this, this trial. And as I said, we will be making a decision on initiation timelines once we complete the discussions on orphan indication designation, as well as um, potential reduction in size and scope of the phase three trial with CBER. So in summary, you can see here uh, all of the program timelines listed across uh, 2021 and 2022. You can see that, you know, starting to show some early green checks on here for things that are completed and with a number of important potentially value-creating milestones still to come. As I mentioned earlier, our cash position and our financial situation is, is quite strong and stable. Uh, we had, at the end of last year, uh, we were burning approximately um, $5 million a quarter. That will increase um, somewhat during the first and second quarter of this year as we intensify recruitment around the Freedom Trial. But we still project uh, that we will finish the year with cash on the balance sheet and, um, and have some runway into early 2021 with no uh, debt currently uh, held by the company. I will mention, of course, that in order to get through 22 and into early 23, we will be uh, raising money, and, and that, you know, that amount is probably on the order of approximately uh, $25 uh, million. But we have a number of grant applications in that could also provide non-dilutive funding and offset the total amount of additional capital needed uh, to get us through to 2023. So coming back to the summary, again, we are a platform company, multi-product development pipeline, Two of our products have the regenerative medicine breakthrough fast track designations. Uh, we're working only in uh, highly unmet medical needs where we have a competitive uh, positioning with strong IP that will protect our portfolio well into the next uh, decade and a number of value creating events across the next year to two with the ability to execute during the course of this year and uh, with a management team that has experience um, operating the company in a very prudent fashion and generating uh, progress across the pipeline. So I want to thank you all for taking the time to listen to me this morning. Uh, we have a few minutes. I think I was going to ask a few questions that I'm happy to answer. And if anyone has any direct questions, would like to learn more about the company, uh, please feel free to contact our head of investor relations, John Mendito, with the uh, contact information that's on the screen. Our Ticker symbol on the NASDAQ is CLBS, and we'd love to see you join us as shareholders as we embark on the development of regenerative therapies that reverse chronic disease. Thank you very much. Hello, David. Thank, thanks for this informative uh, presentation. It's you, quite exciting to see such a diverse portfolio. So I'll start with some general questions, then I'll get into more specific to the programs. So my sure. first question will be CD34 targeting. I know multiple different uh, clinical trials ongoing in the space, and I'm curious how you are differentiating from others. Well, we differentiate in, in a couple of ways, I hope. First of all, you know, our, our CD34 CXCR4 cells are covered by patents, 
And, and so they actually are protected in that regard. Many other cellular therapies, like those that are that are derived from the bone marrow. CD, a lot of people can use CD34 cells in transplantation and a number of other things, and they just simply collect a sample, uh, I'll call it a, you know, to use the technical term, a gamish, basically just a mixture, a heterogeneous mixture of cells in which there are some CD34 cells. Ours are purified, well-defined, characterized in the GMP uh, process. Uh, they're patent protected, and and they also are um, in a situation where I think that we know that we have the ability to cryopreserve them, and that they retain their viability. So we have a great deal of flexibility uh, afforded to us in the handling of these cells that um, you know makes the cost of goods um, manageable and and certainly less expensive than a, than a number of other cells. We also have the ability to have demonstrated uh, technical transfer of the manufacturing or processing of these cells around the world and the ability for multiple investigators to administer the cells, go through the process, and reproduce the results that we have generated. That's helpful, David. So I actually have another question on the manufacturing side. So since each program targets CD34, but they have different differences, right. so how do you handle the manufacturing? Do you have a facility? each of them can be easily converted to other one? Like, how do you actually, since I think cell therapies have a lot of hurdles on the manufacturing side, especially right. cost effectiveness, as you mentioned. So we have a, a contract manufacturer with whom we've partnered in Cognate Bioservices here in the United States and, and one in Japan called the FBIRI uh, in Kobe in Japan, uh, as well as Hitachi uh, Chemical in, in Yokohama in, in Japan. And those, um, the, the process and the early stages for the products is identical. That is, most of, you know, the products are all mobilized using GCSF. Uh, they're all, then a sample of monocytes is always collected through an apheresis, and that sample is then sent to the processing, processing facility where a proprietary magnetic bead separation technique is utilized. The, the differentiation comes in the final steps of the process where the, uh, the diluent composition, the volume of the diluent uh, is different based upon each indication because each indication has a different site of administration. So for example, CLBS-16 is administered as an intracoronary injection. CLBS-12 or Honedra is an intramuscular injection. Uh, CLBS-201, the kidney program, will be an intra-arterial injection. And the oligo product for Norda is actually an intramyocardial injection done using a mapping catheter. So each of those requires different volumes and, and, and different conditions, different composition of the diluent, uh, and, and that's how they're differentiated. That's why they're not interchangeable. Okay, that's understandable. So my another general question is, as I understand, each program is a single administration. This is just confirming. So every, every asset is a single administration. Okay. That's right. We're developing what we hope will be curative treatments. We're not, you know, so there may be, uh, upon further study, the need for the equivalent of a, I'll call it a booster treatment at some point years in the future. But for all the studies that we've done now, uh, we've had, you know, a uh, lengthy follow-up of patients post-study that uh, demonstrates that the durability of the effect lasts for years. That, that's great, actually. So, talking about each program individually this time. So, CMD program, Freedom Trial, first patient was dosed this morning, and mm -hmm. you mentioned top-line data will come in 2022. I am curious. Uh, will you have data updates throughout? I assume that that would be a yes. If so, what would be the timeline? Okay, so unfortunately, it's a no. And the reason <laughs> is that we didn't, we did not build an interim analysis into this trial because it would have increased the size and we didn't want to, uh, you know, take the, the penalty on alpha from the statistics. So, so in order to keep the size and the ability to enroll rapidly um, manageable, uh, this is a a fully placebo-controlled randomized trial. So there is no interim update on data. There will be updates on progress in terms of execution, 
and um, and and you know, and that will be that. So it's a, we're about you know a, a year to fifteen months away from being in a position for to report top line data. Now I'm hoping that you know we can speak to uh, data perhaps sooner than the third quarter if we can achieve enrollment completion before the end of this year, and we're going to be taking a number of steps to try to do that. I understand. And my second question is regarding the CLDS-12 program. So you have the clinical trials designations in Japan. Do you have any strategies to move it to U.S.? Are you planning to partner? Do you plan to, I guess, expand the market on that sense? So um, we do have plans to move Honedra into the, into the United States. And, um, you know, we're, we're talking with FDA about the best way forward in that regard. Originally, we had plans to wait until an approval in Japan and then uh, use that data to open the IND here in the United States. I think we have sufficient data now to open an IND, but we want to discuss with FDA the most rapid path to um, approval. And uh, those discussions are ongoing. And I also will mention that you know um, we are capital constrained. So in order to start a program here in the United States for Hanedra, we would have to raise additional capital. But we do have interest not only from investigators and, and the medical community, but also from some potential um, partners. And so it's something that we are seriously exploring. That's helpful, David. So my last question is on the Angina program. Mm -hmm. So I know the uh, strong and met need in the space. I am also aware of how large the enrollment, expected yeah. enrollments for this trial. I was also part of this panel that I listened to by FDA and one of the uh, questions that the company received was regarding the endpoints, how it can be quantitative versus quality, like it's right. patient's quality of life versus imaging. So what is this, like what do you think about the endpoints for this? I know that you're still in discussions, but I'm just curious, what, right. what are your thoughts on that? So, you know, we believe that the historical endpoint of exercise tolerance is as close to a quantitative measurement that you can get without using an imaging technique. And unfortunately, the agency has never to date accepted any of the imaging techniques as a uh, registration endpoint in a trial for a product. So even though something like coronary flow reserve or spec imaging or some other um, type of MRI could be utilized, um, it's never been accepted as a validated endpoint. So we think the next best thing is probably um, the exercise tolerance or, or exercise capacity uh, tests, which, uh, you know, are, are, do have placebo effects, as you might imagine, but which are, are pretty well documented historically and in a, and in a placebo controlled trial could be controlled. And so we think that that's really the best thing. So while we would love to, to, to talk to to FDA and get them to agree to something like CFR or some other technique. Those are, you know, to some extent intrusive measurements and patients are more likely to enroll in a trial where they don't have to go through multiple intrusive uh, interventions in order to complete the trial. So we're, we're happy with where the endpoints are right now and especially happy since we haven't been required to, um, to perform outcomes trials. That sounds great. Thank you so much again for your participation, David. Pleasure to thank host you. Thank you, Ahu, and uh, I wish you a, a good conference, and thank you again for your, your interest in, in Coladrius. Have a good day. You too. Bye-bye.